approach to environmental justice as highlighted in her book, As Long as Grass Grows, the Indigenous Fight for Environmental Justice from Colonization to Standing Rock. Tonight's event and this speaker series is brought to you by the Institute for Integrated Conservation, the Center for Racial and Social Justice, the American Indian Research Center, the Native Studies Minor, the History Department, and the Anthropology Department. Thank you all. Thank you to all our collaborators for their support and partnership on this series. Before we begin, we wanted to acknowledge the indigenous peoples who are the original inhabitants of the land that the William & Mary campus is on today. The, the Cherokee and Galloway, Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Madaponai, Monacan, Nansmon, Nodaway, Pamunki, Padawumaki, Upper, Upper Madaponai, and Rapahana tribes, and pay our respects to their tribal members, past and present. Tonight's event is part of the 2021 2022 Conservation Speaker Series. We would like to invite you to participate in several upcoming events. On October 7th, the IEC will be hosting an open house to celebrate our launch in 2020 and our growing conservation network. We invite you to stop by the IEC house to learn more about how you can get involved in advancing integrated solutions to conservation challenges. You will also have an opportunity to learn about the projects that William and Mary undergrad students have been doing in collaboration with local conservation partners in 2021. Food and drinks will be served. Please stop by the IEC house in 221 North Bander Street. Additionally, we, we invite William and Mary undergrad students to join us for an info session at the Cohen Career Center on October 11 to learn about the year long conservation research program. Students will learn about how they can work with external conservation partners and faculty mentors on applied conservation projects that advance real world conservation solutions. They will learn about the application process and they will hear firsthand from students currently in the program. As part of the IEC seminar series on environmental justice and indigenous voices in conservation, we will be hosting an event featuring a discussion with, with Wilbur Slokish Jr., the chief of the, of the Klikitak tribe and member of the, Confederate, of the Confederated Tribes and the Bands of the Yakama Nation, who has dedicated his life to protecting the treaty rights and water resources of the river people. In 19, 82, Slokish was arrested along with David Sohapi Sr. and three other native men for illegally fishing and selling their, their catch from their home along the, the Columbia River, a case now known as Salmo Scam. This two-part event will include a screening of documentary River People behind the case of David Sohapi, followed by a discussion led by history professor Andy Fisher with Wilbur Slokish Jr reflecting on the legacy of Salmon Scan and his lifelong commitment to environmental justice. Finally, on October 29th, we invite you to join us in our support of the 15 William and Mary undergrad students in the IEC Conservation Research Program, who will, who will be presenting the results of their year-long conservation research projects they have completed in collaboration with external conservation partners. Please visit the IEC website to learn more about this event and to register. We hope to see you up, up, at all these upcoming events. Tonight's event will start with a talk by, by Dina Gilio Whitaker and will end with a Q&A session. We encourage questions from, from participants. To ask questions, please use the, the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. All attendees, mics, and videos will be turned off throughout the, this event. Tonight's event will, will be recorded and we will be sending a follow-up email with a link to the recording. Information about upcoming events will also be circulated by tomorrow. Without further ado, it is my distinct pleasure on behalf of the collaborating partners bringing you this event to introduce Professor Dina, Professor Dina Gilio Whitaker. Professor Dina Dina Gilio Whitaker, who is a descendant of the COVID Confederated Tribes, is a renowned indigenous author, scholar, journalist, professional surfer, and a lecturer of American studies at California State University, San Marcos, whose work has brought indigenous resistance to government and land incursions to the forefront of national conversations and offers new approaches to environmental justice. 
Ilya Widaker serves as the policy director and senior research associate at the Center for, world, for the World Indigenous Studies, where she works with indigenous governments to formulate environmental policy strategies in cooperation with federal and state governments and organizations. She co-authored the, the book, All the Real Indians Died Off, and 20 Other Myths About Native Americans by Big Compress 2016, and just released her, her latest book, As Long As Grass Grows, the Indigenous Fight for Environmental Justice from, from Colonization to Standing Rock. This evening's conversation will explore the centuries-long struggles indigenous communities have faced regarding land rights, treaty violations, and food and water security, and their fight against the government and corporate interests and incursions on their lands. Through, through the lens of indigenous environmental justice, Hilia Widaker will engage us in a discussion about new approaches to environmental justice policy and activism. Thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us, Professor Hilia Widaker. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. Why peace nux silk? E squeeze Dina Julia would occur. Uh, I am a descendant of the Colville Confederated Tribes in Washington State, um, the Sinaixt Ban, and I am, um, but I was born and raised in Southern California, so I did not grow up in my tribal community, and that's as a direct result of federal policy of the 1950s that we call termination, um, in which the federal government was working um, to dispossess native peoples of their lands and uh, get them off the reservations and blend into society. So um, that really, sh this is a history that really shifted things for, uh, for Native American people in the 1950s, 1960s. So, um, so I place myself, I situate myself in that historical context. That's how I, how I understand myself as a Native person. Um, it took me a long time to get to that point. I had a lot of unlearning to do. Um, so much of how we talk about American Indian people today is about unlearning uh, and relearning um, and relearning actual, you know, documented history and understanding how all of these things come together. And that's what I bring to this conversation around American Indian um, environmental justice and all the other topics that I study. So um, I uh, am coming to you from the traditional and unceded homelands of the Ahashiman Nation in what's currently called Orange County in Southern California, uh, the town of San Clemente. So, you know, we acknowledge that the, these are lands that were never uh, given um, by that tribal, tribal uh, com community and um, these, uh, these are people who are still, you know, holding it down and keeping their, their cultures together, even though they are not even federally recognized tribe, but um, still recognize themselves as the indigenous people. Um, so let's see, all of that said, I'm going to go ahead and stop, start my um, screen share and share with you a PowerPoint that I have. And let's see, here we go. So uh, what I wanna to talk to you about is I'm gonna give you kind of an overview of this idea of uh, indigenized and decolonized environmental justice and how I think about it and how I came to this, uh, to think about environmental justice in this way, because it's, it's you know, the result of a, a long journey of my own life as a Native person, but also, you know, my academic journey as a student as well. So, um, so what do we mean when we say um, indigenizing environmental justice? Um, the reason that I come to this framework is because of the work that I was doing as a student. Um, I had always been very interested in environmental issues, you know, going back, uh, you know, decades now when I first became aware of, of the environmental movement really in the 1980s. And um, 
I, I just, so I had always identified as kind of a, an environmental activist or an environmentalist at least, but really knowing myself as a native person first and how our people have always valued the land and had a very different kind of relationship to the land compared to the dominant society. So um, when I got to grad school, I, so I'd been studying this, I, I was late to this conversation as a student. Um, I was a non-traditional student. I went back to school later in life. And, uh, and so I was in an American Indian studies program um, studying these issues, studying environmental issues from an in indigenous lens, from an American Indian lens specifically, and, um, and learning how, how Native people think about these, these issues. Um, I took a class in environmental justice as an undergrad in the Native American Studies Department at the University of New Mexico, where I was. And, and the class was, I was struck by how little literature we were reading that was actually written by Native people, by American Indian people. And um, so it was, it was, I mean, I can look back on it now and say that it was really, um, it was just a budding conversation, a budding literature. It was just beginning to take form. And so, so, but it, but it was really apparent to me that, that it was pretty sparse, this literature. And so by the time I got into grad school, I was in an American, an American studies program at the same university, but in you know, this grad program. And I took another course in environmental justice, but in this grad course, um, all of the literature I was reading on environmental justice was none of it was written from an indigenous perspective. And it barely even touched on indigenous or American Indian um, perspectives. So, you know, I, I've, I just was like motivated by that. And all of the research that I was doing as a grad student was focused in that direction, like trying to understand, like, try, you know, do the research in that, in that way. And, um, and so I did that all the way through grad school till I finally got to um, working on a master's thesis. And I had to, I, and I knew I was gonna write a master's thesis, but I needed a topic. So I was living at the time in New Mexico um, and I was reestablishing my connections to Southern California and um, specifically to uh, San Clemente, the town that I live in now. And San, San Clemente is known as the uh, kind of the epicenter of surf culture in California, in the, the continental United States. And, um, and so as a surfer, somebody who was very, I brought together like these very diverse interests, interests in surfing and beach culture um, to a um, uh, a story that I learned about something that happened in, in the town, in San Clemente, a, a history of the fight to protect a Native American sacred site um, from the building of a toll road. And so I did a case study that I, when I heard about this story, I, I was like, that's what I'm gonna study um, and see how this Native American sacred site of a tribe that's not federally recognized how they were able to protect the site in collaboration with other communities, other diverse stakeholders like surfers, like environmentalists, um, and um, you know, organized groups like the Sierra Club and others um, that worked for years to stop the building of this toll road. And so I wanted to know specifically about what was it, how did the fact that a Native American sacred site factor into the success of that campaign. This was called the Save Trestles campaign. So that's what I looked at. And, um, and that became the master's thesis. And then that became the seed for what turned into this book, As Long As Grass Grows. 
So um, in that study that I did, this case study, this thesis, I theorized that what I learned from studying that, that event was that that environment, this thing that we call environmental justice is really different for American Indians than it is for all other populations. Like the, 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 the history of injustice um, is really different. And the reason that it's different is because American Indian people um, um, are not just racial, ethnic, racialized ethnic minority populations. And the concept of environmental justice is founded on this concept of environmental racism, that environmental racism is what exposes communities of color to greater risk and harm um, because it's a system of, of you know, structural racism that is responsible for that. That makes sense in certain communities like black communities in the South or um, Latin America, you know, Latinx or you know, Mexican populations in the US. Um, with these very particular histories, this, this theory makes sense. But for American Indian populations, it doesn't, it's not, it's incomplete because of American Indians' relationship to land and relate political relationship to the US that begins with invasion, genocide, and then land theft. So all of that together constitutes a very different experience of of um, environmental injustice. And so until we incorporate and understand the, this history in that way, um, then the way that we talk about environmental justice is not going to be responsive to native populations. Um, and so the way that we talk about environmental justice in, you know, in terms of theory and activism and law and policy, um, it's got to grapple with this history of colonialism um, in order to be responsive to, to native needs and to native um, discourses. And it's got to acknowledge this political difference of American Indians as nations with these political relationships to the state um, that are beyond this category that we call ethnic minorities or racialized ethnic others. And so, so how do we talk about that? What is the, what is the theoretical framework that we use when we talk about this in American Indian studies? We talk about this theoretical foundation of settler colonialism. Um, this is beyond post-colonial studies, right? So settler colonialism is, um, is really, it, it speaks much with much more greater specificity to these histories than post-colonial studies. Um, when I came into um, my program as an undergrad studying American, in, you know, American Indian studies, we really hadn't fully articulated this foundation yet. It was still really being formed. Now, this is how American Indian studies, you know, invariably understands itself in terms of um, settler colonial theory. And, um, and in this framework of settler colonial theory, you know, we, we can understand it through the, the, this image, this particular image, which is, um, you know, so foundational to the American social landscape, you know, this, this, this painting is uh, classic. It was painted in 1872 by John Gast. It's called American Progress. And what this image does is it is it um, is a visual representation of what manifest destiny is and what it did and does as a, an ongoing process of settler colonialism. So this depicts a history, yes, but it also depicts um, a uh, a, it's a visual discourse of how this structure that we call settler colonialism operates for American Indian people. And if we, you know, if we sort of deconstruct this image, we look at this, um, this image um, with this, the central figure who is this, you know, white angelic looking woman, her name is Columbia. Um, we're sort of tempted to think that she's an angel, but she's not an angel. She's actually, you know, just a, a person, but she's floating across the landscape in this sort of angelic way with her robes flowing. 
and she's um, carrying on her in her arm a book that we're you know we may be t tempted to think is a bible but it's not it's actually a book of education and on her arm she carries this roll of a wire and you see the wire attached to what's you know probably a telegraph wire going all the way to the right which is the east and the east is where the the sun is rising so we can we can presume that this is the east coast of the continent um, where Europeans first or first arrive and set themselves up this settler society establishes itself and it establishes itself based on Euro European Eurocentric norms um, and technology and we see the technology embodied in the 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 in the distance these this urbanized environment we see ships we see bridges we see uh, you know, the railroad making its way west. Uh, we see, you know, stagecoaches and uh, covered wagons, and we see intrepid pioneers, and we see uh, miners and farmers and bringing with them the implements of modern farming technology. And as, and they're moving west. And as they're moving, at this, this westward movement is happening, it's sort of bringing the light, the light is sweeping across the landscape in this way to imply that it's chasing out the darkness. And, and in the darkness, we see the representation of, um, you know, native people over to the left. Um, Indians are running away, presumably in fear of this light. And we see the buffalo running and we see the wild animals, we see a bear and we see a wolf. And, um, and so we're, you know, the, the message here is obvious. It's that the, the superiority of European technology um, and in European enlightenment, literally chasing out the darkness of uh, uncivilized people who live in, you know, a, a state of, of wildness and um, uncivilization. And so, in this, this representation <clears throat> is contained the narratives that the US is founded on. And this is about indigenous people being constructed as inferior, um, as uh, in need of civilization and, in, and also destined to fade away in the face of European superiority. And this narrative is about the legitimizing, the taking of land, the very violent taking of land through this process of manifest destiny, which is the rationalization of this taking. Um, and we're all familiar with that narrative. And so what happens is that it, it, this narrative also justifies um, the foundation of an entire legal structure that maintains the, this paternalistic and hegemonic relationship between the US and American Indian nations. Um, and that's a whole big conversation that I don't have time to get into, but the, this begins uh, with the first Supreme Court decision in 1823 that, that is about American Indians. It doesn't, um, it doesn't involve American Indians, but it's about them, about the, the US need to establish clear land titles and so this, this case called Johnson versus McIntosh gets argued and, and it's the, this case establishes what's called the doctrine of discovery. And the doctrine of discovery is then becomes the foundation for an entire body of law that still governs American Indian lands and lives today. And, and it's all about this narrative of Europe of European superiority, indigenous inferiority in order to maintain the structure of justifying that taking of land. And so we say that settler colonialism is always genocidal um, because settler colonialism is about the elimination of the native, as Patrick Wool famously said in his 2006 essay, it's about eliminating the native in order to replace. That's what settler colonialism does, eliminates native populations in order to replace with settler populations. 
And these are all very whitewashed narratives that we are all socialized in our educations um, and, and um, conditioned to believe, whether we're aware of it or not. So, so as this process of uh, settle, settling happens going from East to West throughout you know, several centuries, a few a handful of centuries actually, um, it, it's about the remaking of the landscape in a Euro in the image of, of um, Europeans. And, and, and it's all done in this language of modernity. And um, so Western expansion, we understand this term Western expansion, the industrial revolution, these are all very positive ways of depicting this, this um, very profoundly violent history. Um, and in ways that are that celebrate this, you know, narrative of European superiority, and um, and it's all about progress. And um, but but as as it's narrating itself in this way, these these narratives of European superiority and genius and in, industrial, uh, you know, innovation and all of that kind of stuff is all about what it, while it's bringing progress to settler populations, it's bringing death and destruction to indigenous populations. And it does this in a huge variety of ways. And, um, and so the, the images that I have here uh, are just a very, very brief examples of how it does that in these particular landscapes. Uh, the image on the left you see is the, the image of the Missouri River watershed. Um, this is where the Standing Rock Sioux tribe is, where, um, you know, the, the book that I wrote, As Long As Grass Grows, it takes Standing Rock as a, another case study of what, as a really recent example of what environmental injustice is for Native people. And of course, that was about the stopping of the building of an oil pipeline through treaty protected lands. And, um, uh, so if we focus on this, this particular landscape, this region, this ecosystem, this is the, the watershed of the Missouri River, um, which is the homelands of the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota people. And um, it's the home of several, uh, of seven different reservations of Lakota people. And um, this is um, what was once called the Great Sioux Nation. Um, these small reservations are the remnants of a much larger uh, chunk of land that was reserved through treaties, but then was whittled down through the illegal actions of the federal government over time. Um, but these seven reservations is what is, uh, what is left. And um, the Standing Rock Reservation is right up here Oh shoot! Uh, right up here at the border of North and South Dakota, um, the 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 river, the this river watershed was underwent a massive environmental um, uh, kind of overhaul with the passage of the Pick Sloan Act in 1944. Um, this area is very known for flooding. It's very low lying land. And um, in 1944, this Pick Sloan Act was passed in order to create, uh, was to, to do this flood control, uh, you know, to control the flooding of these lands and also to create lakes because that's what dams do. Dams create lakes that have different purposes um, besides flood control, but also to create water sources for irrigation, for farming. And um, the Pick Sloan Act created five dams on the Missouri River watershed. And the, the outcome for Lakota people was the flooding of massive tracts of land where Lakota people lived, um, where they had lived for centuries. There were village sites, there were home sites, there were timber resources, there were food resources, medicine resources. Um, and when these dams were built in the 1940s, it flooded those lands and those lands uh, displaced 
um, over 900 families. So we're talking thousands of people, um, thousands of people who are, uh, many of whom are still alive today. So they have that memory in their, in their own ex lived experience of what that did to Lakota life, how it profoundly altered um, the way that they lived and all the cultural loss that that represented. Um, so this, this is a very recent history that shapes the lives of those people. Um, now something you know, similar happens to the, in this middle image on the Columbia River. Um, I heard um, Professor Galliano talking about, you're gonna be having a, an event coming up in, in, in a few weeks about um, uh, salmon, salmon Scam and the showing of a, a film called River People. This is very much tied to, this is exactly, you're gonna be hearing about this history um, here. And, and this is the history of the people in the lower, that this, this history that you're gonna hear about in a couple of weeks happens in the lower um, Columbia River watershed or the the what's called the southern plateau and um, this is the the Yakima people the the Umatilla people people who are Columbia River people who who are um, whose lives revolve around the salmon uh, in a place called Celilo Falls um, now in the upper so this is in this area right here is the lower Columbia River plateau the the land of Celilo, the place of Celilo Falls, which was a massive salmon fishery. Now up here on the upper Columbia Plateau, this is where my people are from on the Colville Reservation. Um, we had a salmon fishery there too called Kettle Falls. And in 19, around 1940, a, another dam was built. The, the early 20th century was a time of um, massive infrastructure projects that went along with the the world's works progress administration of um, the you know the the Roosevelt administration to revitalize the depressed American economy, and so they did these massive infrastructure projects to help jumpstart the the um, the economy, and dams were a huge part of this. So they built a dam on the Colville Reservation called the Grand Coulee Dam. The Grand Coulee Dam was the biggest reservation in. I mean, uh, the, the great, the biggest dam project in the world at the time. And it was highly celebrated for this, you know, feat of engineering genius. Um, but what it did was it dammed the Columbia River and the lake that it created backed up many miles and it flooded our um, salmon fishery of Kettle Falls. So, uh, so in Kettle, in by 1941, our are the, this is the heart of our culture. This is the heart of cultures of this entire region in British Columbia and Northern Washington and Montana and Idaho. Um, for thousands of years, this was the center of culture. People came here to, sal to salmon fish and salmon was for our people what buffalo is to the people on the plains. So, um, but so what's so that was that was one particular history of dam building, um, but then you have the you know what you see on that image is this the ongoing building of other dams uh, in these tributaries in the Columbia River watershed, um, and the ecological impact the impact altogether that, that this has these dam building projects in this region is that it is that it. Uh, impedes um, salmon runs and the ability of salmon to perpetuate themselves. And so it's led to this massive, um, this massive collapse of salmon populations that, that we are currently experiencing today. Not only is it genocidal, like a culturally genocidal impact for, um, for Columbia River people, but it's uh, an ecological and ecocidal impact. So this concept of ecocide, you know, brings it brings together several concepts like the killing of an ecosystem, um, combined with uh, the the term genocide, which 
when you have these kinds of massive remaking of landscapes like this are culturally genocidal to native people. So you have the ecocidal impacts of the, the environment plus the, the, the cultural impacts to people. So it's sort of a double whammy. So for us, we didn't suffer the kind of displacement that the, the, the Sioux, the Lakota Sioux people did in the, the watershed, but it's more of an ongoing unfolding, unfolding ecological crisis that um, we're dealing with today. Now, something completely different happens on, um, in this image on the right, which is a representation of uranium mining in the Western United States. And, particularly in the Southwest, where you see um, all of these black dots represent uh, the, the proliferation of mines, of uranium mines. And of course, this history goes back to, um, to the early 20th century. It really, uh, it really, um, it cements itself in the 1940s, again, the same period. Um, that the dam building era happens in, but it's really in response to the, the Manhattan Project and the building of nuclear weapons uh, in the US and, and then later the, the um, you know, nuclear power industry. So all, it turns out all this uranium, which you know, is what is the source material for nuclear power and nuclear weapons, turns out Two thirds of all the uranium deposits on the continent in the US are on native land. So native people get shoved off to lands that settler people don't want. These are considered wastelands. Then uranium's discovered and now it's, it's um, a resource that settler, the settler government wants. So it goes about you know, massively extracting uranium from these lands for decades, but it's done in this very unsafe way, um, especially in the Navajo Nation. And for decades, this goes on. Navajo people and Pueblo people are sent into these mines, you know, under the guise of the jobs program. Um, they are given no safety equipment whatsoever. Um, not surprising when a few decades later, there is massive, um, you know, outbreaks of lung disease and lung cancers and respiratory illness that, uh, and they're dying, you know, of, you know, in huge numbers because of the, you know, basically radiation poisoning, and um, and so you know, the mining stops and. But what's happened is that none of these mines are cleaned up, and so to this day you have um, hundreds in the thousands of mines on the, what's called the Colorado Plateau, where these, these uncleaned up mines are still leaching um, radioactive waste into the lands and the air and the water of native people still impacting their health. So um, this is a different kind of environmental injustice just as um, the, you know, the history of dam building has um, is, is an environmental injustice for native people uh, on this massive scale. So, um, so the, the point here is about how modern settler life has these you know, devastating impacts, these environmental injustice uh, to native populations that are ongoing, they don't end and they're structural. So in the book, um, I'm giving you pretty much highlights of um, some of the main themes that I, that I tackle in the book. And one of the themes that I tackle in the book is the history of the environmental movement. And it's really a very problematic uh, relationship to Indian country. Um, it's not something that has been written about a lot. I, it's something I wanted to write about for a long time. And I was um, glad that I got the chance to do that. Because I'm a child of the 1960s and I grew up in California, I grew up, I sort of identify with the, the counterculture movement. Uh, and I saw how it went wrong. I saw the, you know, while the, the, that era of, of cultural resurgence um, was 
you know, it's still so celebrated in, in America today, you know, this countercultural movement. Um, it's, there was, uh, it has so many problems for American Indian people. Um, and part of that is how the environmental movement was deeply embedded and, and uh, connected to that time, to this cultural resurgence. Um, so sometimes referred to as second wave environmentalism. But if we, if we take that as part of a larger continuum of environmental, growing environmental awareness in the US, um, it traces its origin to the conservation and preservation movements, which have their roots in the mid um, 19th century. If we take it back to Ralph Waldo Emerson and the transcendentalists, um, and, and people like Henry David Thoreau, who also came out of that, that time period in the mid 1800s. Um, and then later, John Muir, you know, he comes to California from Wisconsin. And of course, he becomes famous for as one of the founders of the Sierra Club in 1891 or so. And, and so they, they, you know, have this idea that comes out of this anxiety of growing urbanization in, in the East Coast. And, you know, going back to that image that we saw of Columbia and, you know, that, that painting American progress in, you know, to the right, the, in, and the, the urbanization of Eastern cities and this growing anxiety about the loss of, you know, so-called wilderness. And that gives birth to these, these wilderness or these um, narratives about the virgin wilderness. Of course, that, that had been, pretty well entrenched in, uh, in the American mind, you know, beginning in the 1600s and the idea of uh, wilderness as unpeopled landscapes and the pristine myth. Um, and, you know, this, the separation of people from landscapes and that's what they brought to this idea of conservation and preservation that wilderness needed to be protected and the way that you protect it was to prevent people from being in there. Um, and that this gave birth to the National Park System, National Park Service in 1872 with the creation of Glacier National Park and then later, um, I'm oh, sorry, the first one was um, Yellowstone and then Glacier and then Yosemite. And this is, uh, you know, what's happening at that time, it's during the 1870s when the federal government is aggressively pursuing native people, forcing on them treaties um, that push them onto reservations and dispossess them of their traditional lands, which is um, classically the case in, in, the, in the case of, of Yellowstone. And, um, and as Mark David Spence talks about in his book, Dispossessing the Wilderness, when he really breaks all this down, he talks about how, you know, this concept of wilderness had to first be created. Um, and that's what happens with the, the establishment of uh, Yellowstone as, as this wilderness, um, you know, national park. And then it gets replicated with, with, um, Yellow, with Yosemite here in California. Um, and these are places of long, long, long-term indigenous habitation. These are places that are deeply important to native people. They are places of uh, where they live, where they have sacred sites, places of significant cultural and spiritual um, importance, uh, not to mention so sources of food. Uh, so these are places that native people have always used and, and, but then, you know, because of these narratives of conservation and preservation, uh, they need to be protected for, uh, you know, human, human use, um, but indigenous, dis, you know, ha it, it all happens on, in this way of dispossessing indigenous people to make it happen. Um, and white supremacy, so when we think back on European, this idea of European su uh, supremacy and superiority, um, it's all bound up with whiteness. Um, and that's the foundation of all of this, native peoples as inferior so that Europeans are superior. And 
Um, this, of course, all gets encoded into the legal system. So by the time the mid 19th, mid 20th century comes along and the counterculture um, emerges with this new second wave of environmental um, uh, you know, thought uh, with, you know, that comes with these new threats to the environment with things like um, the massive oil spill in Santa Barbara in 1968 with things like the, the Cuyahoga River catches on fire, uh, you know, in that and that happens around that same era in that era. And other things are, you know, pollution is uh, becoming um, a thing that, you know, and littering and we then we get this, uh, we get this uh, new campaign by something called the, the Keep America Beautiful uh, campaign. And it's about, um, you know, preventing littering and this new term pollution. And, and so what happens is this, this group, Keep America Beautiful, um, comes up with this campaign to, uh, to the, that uses images of Indians. It's the first time that Indians are, are referred to in this way in, in, um, in America that is you know, some, somewhat respectable. But Indians, it's a new stereotype and it's the stereotype of, um, this is the, the savage the stab, savage Indian, right? Before Indians were savages, they've always been savages, uh, noble, but they become you know, violent savages and they, the, they sort of progress from being violent savages to being noble savages toward the end of the 19th century because they're no longer a military threat. Um, and they become romanticized in this period. Um, and, and then there's this new kind of uh, sensibility to save the Indians, to save the disappearing noble savage. By the time the mid 19th, uh, 20th century comes along in this budding environmental movement, the, the noble savage appears as the ecological Indian uh, set, which is just a repackaged um, version of the noble savage stereotype. So all of this stuff gets, um, gets encoded into the social landscape and in the counterculture um, gets all bound up with it too. And, and native people, you know, it's, it's mixed though, because while there's this sort of respect for Indians, um, it's really a fetishizing of native people in a way that keeps them locked into these stereotypes um, which fundamentally are about the ongoing erasure of native people because of the kinds of cultural appropriation that comes from it through um, the, you know, adopting of the aesthetic of the Indian in the hippie culture with the, the growing of the long hair and the wearing of headbands and the wearing of beads and feathers and living in teepees and these hippie communes, all of that. It's all bound up in these very problematic um, ways. So, so it's you know really breaking down like how, even though it's well-intentioned, it's an unexamined history of how white supremacy and settler supremacy is at, at the root of all of this. So, so what's the cost of all of this? What's sacrificed in this? What's sacrificed in all of that perpetual and habitual erasure of actual indigenous people is the knowledges embedded in indigenous cultures. Um, and, and this is something that, you know, environmental justice, when we talk about environmental justice and decolonizing it and indigenizing it, we have to talk about um, what indigenous knowledge is and the kinds of, um, the kinds of philosophies and foundations that indigenous knowledges are, are built upon. And, um, and we can talk about these indigenous knowledges in ways that, um, that are fairly specific. Um, indigenous knowledge or IK is sort of a broad way of talking about um, the ways that native people constructed who they are, whether their culture is based on particular ecosystems, environments, um, that, which, and because they're so specific, because they're place based, there is not one monolithic indigenous knowledge. There are many indigenous knowledges. 
Um, and there are different types of indigenous knowledges like traditional ecological knowledge, TEK is one type of indigenous knowledge. Um, and it's always, again, place-based and based on um, epistemologies, cultural epistemologies, that, that term epistemology simply means knowledge systems and how a community or a culture comes to know what it knows in, about itself in the world. So these epistemologies at the root of traditional ecological knowledge um, are, are based in concrete ways of engaging with ecosystems on the land. Um, this is applied knowledge. This is not just theoretical knowledge. This is based on thousands and thousands of years of interaction with these environments, with these ecosystems. And, um, and so we can talk about these in very specific ways. And, um, and I have a, a, an example to show you about what in applied TEK, applied ecological knowledge looks like. And, and it's a, this quick little video that I'm gonna show you. And I apologize in advance if the, if the video, sometimes what happens when I show this, sometimes in Zoom, it's a little jumpy and it's not smooth. So I apologize for that. Um, but, but you will be able to see at least what it's, uh, you know, what the, the point of this is about TEK being applied knowledge. This forest is about to go up in flames. Don't worry, it's intentional. We're here in Roslyn, Washington at a prescribed burn, and it's actually supposed to make the forest more resistant to fires because these woods have been really unhealthy. Think of a prescribed burn as a vaccination against really, really bad fires. And just like giving out shots, you need people who know what they're doing. This is like the main tool of prescribed fire. You get a little bit of a arm workout. Oh, yes. <laughs> Today, prescribed burning is showing up more and more in state forest management policies. Why? Because wildfires are way worse than they used to be. A century of poor forest management and fire suppression has created a lot of fuel to burn. All that underbrush acts like kindling. Climate change leads to hotter temperatures and longer dry periods, which create perfect conditions for a wildfire to start. Put all that together and you have the makings of a disaster. Today's wildfires can even take out big old growth trees that have historically been able to stand up to wildfire. Take this piece of ponderosa pine that's been around for over two centuries. This cross section of a tree trunk is about to teach us a bunch of history. So show some respect and pay attention. Before European settlers arrived, Native American tribes in the Western US were already forest management experts. Many native peoples embraced fire as part of certain ecosystems. In fact, many trees in the West, like ponderosa pines and giant sequoias, are made healthier by regular human managed fire. The Yakima Nation used prescribed burning to keep the forest healthy and to cultivate different resources they depended on, like berry plants. But when colonists showed up, it didn't occur to them that the forests were so impressive and the timber so strong because they'd been taken care of by humans. I mean, there were very colorful responses. In some instances, it is, they're just burning things up. They would also notice these abundant berry fields and they wouldn't always make the connection. In 1910, there was a massive wildfire that spread across Montana, Idaho, and Washington. As a result, the federal government was like, we've got to take better care of these forests. Time for a forest service. Up until that point, there had been some debate over prescribed burning. But the new agency imposed a hard and fast fire suppression policy. No burning, no exceptions. Traditional burning was outlawed and tribal members were punished for practicing it. And it turns out that was not the best way to keep forests healthy. It was also really culturally oppressive. Preventing fires was another way of directly reducing native influence within their ancestral territories. And forests that had been managed by humans for thousands of years were suddenly growing wild and unchecked. So that's basically how we end up here, in a period of time that's warmer than ever before in recorded history, with a whole lot of very unruly forests. Around the 1970s, some ecologists started to point out that suppressing fire in forests was actually making wildfire damage worse. And that way of thinking has gotten more and more traction. 
2014, we had a record wildfire year. In 2015, we broke that record. I think people were, what are all the tools in the toolbox? How do we protect ourselves? How do we make our force more healthy? In 2017, the state of Washington made prescribed burns central to its 20-year fire management plan. We obviously are inheriting a problem that's been over 50 years in the making. It's going to take us a while to get on top of it, but we are going to make a significant difference in restoring the health of our force, and it will include prescribed fire. Which brings us full circle, working with fire instead of suppressing it, a practice that's still alive in many tribal cultures today. What we're really looking at is our group of people have been able to survive for thousands of years based on their relationship, interaction, and management with resources. I don't feel like you're going to have a very efficient project in today's world ignoring a thousands-year-old data set. Okay. This Oops. fourth. Okay, so, so there you go is a, you know, really good, clear example of what applied applied indigenous knowledge looks like and um, this this you you might have be familiar with how prevalent um, in the last couple of years I've really noticed how much this this um, idea of controlled cultural burning is entering the news um, it's really gotten my attention so um, you know, especially out here in California where I live, you know, this is um, more and more uh, being examined, at, you know, how tribes can use these cultural burning in order to help prevent um, these, these massive wildfires that we're experiencing. And, you know, what we can say for sure is that it's not just about climate change. It's not climate change that's causing these fires. It's over a century of mismanagement of the fires and the suppression of fires, as they said, that has led to these conditions. So um, that's something to really keep in mind that, um, that, ex that um, climate change is just the exacerbation of that. So, uh, so what, where does that leave us? Like for me, it's about decolonizing environmental justice. And if we talk about decolonizing environmental justice, we have to talk about um, incorporating this, you know, understanding this broader history of colonialism um, as that which causes environmental injustice to native people. Um, it has to recognize indigenous people's very different relationship to the land. Um, which means recognizing indigenous knowledge and the importance of it in native people's um, you know, land management practices. Also, we need to pay attention to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which enshrines among other things, the right to free prior and informed consent about things that happen on their lands, whether they're reservation lands or treaty protected lands. So this is beyond consultation. Federal law um, does mandate consultation like for things like the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, but it doesn't mandate consent. And that's where we're trying to get to. Um, the US supports, it endorsed the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Now we have to hold their feet to the fire to uphold this idea of consent. That, that has the power to really change things around environmental justice for Native people. And finally, land back. Um, the land back movement, the current land back movement is a real powerful new, um, you know, kind of new way that Native people are articulating. Now we're not afraid to say it anymore. I think that we used to be afraid to say that, give us the land back. Um, the way that I write about it in my book, um, I talk about how, you know, there are different models of how Native land, um, Native jurisdiction is being restored to lands in, in um, a wide variety of ways, including just giving it back, but also in things like um, land trusts and land conservancies and things like that. So, um, and, and collaboration and co-management agreements. So these are all ways that land back is being enacted. And then finally, you know, we have to talk about, um, we have to address what colonial privilege looks like. And this is the, this is what I'm looking at in a current book project 
um, you know, what privilege looks like on stolen land, um, where we where we de-emphasize race because we are not ethnic minorities, we are um, nations with political relationships to the state. These are byproducts of colonialism. These are about how we center land as that which creates social relations in the US in order to get to um, an ethic of accountability where we can um, talk about what, envir what environmental ethics, how environmental ethics um, works together with environmental justice to have better outcomes for indigenous people, for American Indian um, um, populations. That's what I'm thinking about these days. And um, this is my last slide. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the share so that we can uh, open up to conversations, questions and answers. Thank you very much. This was a very thought provoking presentation and I feel so privileged that I got to to teach with your book in my, in my environmental justice class. So, so thank you so much for that addition that we really needed. Um, so talking about that, there is a couple of questions that my students in the environmental justice class prepare for you. Um, so one of the, of the main questions that they were grappling with and they wanted to ask you um, is um, if we consider that these environmental injustices come from, from settler colonialism and settler industrialization, then will we'll changes at the policy level, like for example, the EPA's policy on environmental justice uh, with working with the federally recognized indigenous tribes, would that be enough? Or there needs to be something that needs to change in the relationship between the federal government and native nations that will need to be dramatically restructured to, to change these environmental injustices? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the million dollar questions really and um, something that I think about a lot. And, um, and I think that different people will answer that question in different ways. Um, for me, you know, I think that we're in a really interesting moment right now um, with the election of the Biden administration and their commitments to environmental justice. Um, the administration ha is, um, is very meaningfully integrating um, the ideals and ideologies of environmental justice at every level of what it does in its environmental programming. Um, I'm, they're taking it very seriously from what I can see. And they, they deserve to be applauded for that. Um, the appointment of Deb Howland as the Secretary of the Interior is a really positive uh, move in a really positive direction. Um, that said, um, What's, what we're still left with is a structure that is still fundamentally colonial, right? Based on a legal system that still has at its core the, the ideologies of white settler supremacy and mm -hmm. indigenous inferiority. That's what's not being challenged. And in my mind, you cannot do decolonization without challenging those structures, those relationships of power. Um, and and um, the the philosophies that keep native people frozen in that in 19th century ideology. So um, I think that it's not that there's not good that can come of things like you know a, a native woman at the head of the Department of the Interior um, or you know indigenous you know, better attention in the EPA for indigenous programs and funding and stuff like that. But, but until we get to the root of the problem, then those problems are, they're always going to be um, at risk because administrations come and go, right? We could end up with the Trump administration in another three years, God forbid, but it could happen. And if it does, it'll, it'll reverse all the progress that, that we will have made in, in um, the years of the Biden administration. I shudder to think of what that would look like, but it's always the American political system is very fragile and it's very fleeting. So until we make those structural changes, then we're always going to have, to have these conversations. Absolutely. Also one of the aspects that you mentioned in your, in your book and that my students um, really enjoy Thing about is the contribution of indigenous feminism. Um, could you expand a bit more about uh, what indigenous feminism can help inform or, or rearrange environmental justice in the ways that, that you have been 
describing and for the environmental movement at large as well. Yeah, so indigenous feminism is one of those terms that is, it's a, it's a little problematic in some ways, like a lot of indigenous people would not, you know, a lot of women, native women um, don't subscribe to this idea of feminism um, because, you know, the, they say that in, in our cultures, we didn't need feminism because women, we had already egalitarian gender balance. So um, in the vast majority of tribal cultures, women, women shared power with men. And that happened, it looked different ways in different communities. So, um, so a lot of native women will say, we don't need to have that conversation about feminism. But when you talk about colonialism and, and the, the deep impacts that it's had on native communities then, um, you know, and how we've all been colonized and, and influenced and shaped by, by patriarchy, colonial, what we would call colonial patriarchy now, then that changes the conversation. Um, and the way that I write about it in, in the book is, is to point out about how um, in the, this indigenous cultural resurgence that's come about since the 1960s and 1970s, that it would, the women's leadership, the role in that and how it was inextricably bound up with the protection of land. Um, the, 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 for, the forming of the um, of war and women of all red nations, which came out of the American Indian movement began as uh, with women fighting for reproductive justice. And that was tied to the ways that, that um, native women's bodies were being poisoned because of the runoff of uranium, of uh, waste from uranium mines. And if you had eaten everything, but you only ate your chicken, so I gave you chocolate. Yeah. You almost Sorry didn't get that. anything. Yeah. Oops, okay, Please. I was able. <laughs> Glad I have that power. Um, so, so for Na in Indian country, you know, environmental justice has always the way you know I, the way I trace that history has always been um, about Native women's um, you know active engagement, active role in protecting their environments and um, and protecting their lands. Um, so, and the same is true now when we you know we look at at um, Standing Rock and the No Dapple movement of 2016, it be, was begun by women and youth and, and you know, uh, two-spirit people, people who are non-gender conforming. So um, this is another, another piece of that of gender identity, how um, in traditional native cultures, we didn't have the kinds of um, anxieties around gender um, formation that we do in patriarchal Western, you know, Eurocentric society, um, because we already valued, um, you know, non-gender conform, non-gender binary conforming people. So all of that is to get, you know, all connected in the way that Native scholars write about it. Excellent. And we have some, some questions from the, from the audience. Uh, one, one audience member is asking if you can explain expand on the main aspects of an ethic of accountability? Um, can you repeat that? I didn't hear the last part. If you could expand on the main aspects of an ethic of accountability. Uh-huh. So the way that I'm writing about it right now, and, and you know, looking at environmental studies, like the, the field of environmental studies, environmental ethics, the way the, the narratives that sort of are at the root of that discipline, really they go something like, oh, you know, um, Aldo Leopold is the first guy to have, to articulate an environmental ethic. Um, you know, going back to the early 20th century, of course, Aldo Leopold is, um, uh, you know, he started his career, he was a forester. He started his career in the, in the earliest formations of the US Forest Service, like they talked about in that video. Um, going back to, um, you know, he was a he was mentored by Gifford Pinchot, and um, they, you know, at the time, you know, it was environmental ethics, or you know, it was conservation and preservation. These things that this that's how they called it at that time, and um, and it was about how humans, 
use the land for, for economic purposes. And that's what really shaped those narratives. Well, Aldo Leopold was the first to say that we have to have, um, you know, humans have to be part of the environmental community. Like that's how he had talked about, um, talked about this. You know, we can't think of ourselves as separate. And he's, he had these epiphanies about, um, about it. And, um, you know, kind of later in his career and he wrote, um, the Sand County Almanac, you know, it was the, he published this, well, it was actually published, he died during the publication of that book. The last chapter of that book was the land ethic. And that's been, you know, come to be celebrated as this kind of foundational narrative of this thing that we called environmental ethics. And so it's this white guy, this white conservation guy that fought against native people's cultural burning early in the 20th century, who gets credited for having an environmental ethic when it's native people who had been living on the land for thousands of years based on um, knowledge systems um, that were about relationship to the environment. And that all gets completely ignored um, so that we can uphold this narrative, this white guy narrative um, of environmental ethics. And so um, like we have to expose that and name it for what it is. Um, and stop this, you know, habitual erasure of native people. Um, and so we have to be willing to call that out. And so bringing, um, you know, another piece of this is, is how environmental justice um, as, a, as a field, as a discourse has, you know, is some have argued that there is very little connection between that and environment, the world of environmental ethics. And so how do we have those conversations um, that bring indigenous knowledge into it and, and stops venerating white people as giving birth to this thing that we get called environmental ethics. Like, so, you know, bringing all of this together. And so we're just kind of at the beginning stages of bringing those conversations together. And that's, that's the work that I'm trying to do, talking about you know, a, accountability. Um, how do we talk about white supremacy um, and this foundation of settler colonialism and the way that it celebrates whiteness and is dependent on whiteness um, and indigenous erasure at the same time um, so that we can have so that we can have a country that's that's accountable for this this brutal history um, and the way that it's impacted not just people but environments so it's a very holistic conversation absolutely we have many more questions on the chat but unfortunately we are reaching the, the end of, of our session but one final question so what gives you hope for environmental justice that environmental justice can be achieved in Indian country um, say it one more time so what gives you the hope for the, for the future that environmental justice can be achieved uh, for Native Americans? Well, I'm, I'm optimistic about the Biden administration and their commitments to um, environmental justice and Deb Howland being in, in the Secretary of the Interior seat. Um, this, is, this gives me, uh, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic, although, you know, it's hard not to be cynical, I will say. Um, but if we can keep this conversation moving forward, and I'm also optimistic because what I've seen in my own life in the last um, couple of years since this book has come out, it's sparked some, some amazing conversations. And <clears throat> I've been invited into spaces that Native people very seldom are invited into, like um, the you know, scientists, people doing environmental science, um, people doing environmental law people doing conservation and preservation work, environmental work. Um, it's been pretty overwhelming for me to, to, to see this and to, 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 to know that what I have had to say in this book and you know, matters to people and that they find, they find inspiration in it. Um, and that you know, having these discussions about in, indigenous knowledge conveys a sense of, um, hope for people because they're starting to see the bankrupt nature of Western capitalism and um, economic systems uh, and how they have gotten us to this place of the sixth mass extinction event of ecological collapse, all of that stuff. 
um, people are finally starting to break through these problematic narratives of indigenous peoples as being ignorant savages who don't know how to live on, on the land correctly, because that's you know, what's at the foundation of, of US society. So, um, you know, we're finally, people are being thoughtful about this and being willing to, to hear indigenous voices and include them in decision-making progress, uh, pro uh, conversations and processes and policy. So, you know, hopefully, it'll just continue to grow and we'll be able to make more progress around that. Um, so cautious optimism. Thank you so much again. Um, I know that you have inspired the, the students in my, in my environmental justice class and, and you have inspired us again in this event. Uh, you have given us a lot to, to think about, uh, specifically at the Institute for Integrative Conservation. Um, so uh, with these questions of traditional ecological knowledge and how finally we are looking back at some of these practices such as controlled cultural fire as actually being the solution to many of the problems that were created by the very system of settler colonialism and Western capitalism. So again, thank you very much for, for, for joining us and for the rest of our audience too, a reminder to, to please sign up for the future events. Um, as we discussed, there are some some great events coming on. And we thank you again, Dina, for your participation here tonight. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the invitation and go forth and do good work in the world. And uh, thank you for teaching my work. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everyone.